Angela, an inverted love story, by William Schwenk Gilbert, from Victorian short stories, stories of courtship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I am a poor, paralyzed fellow who, for many years past, has been confined to a bed or a sofa. For the last six years, I have occupied a small room giving on to one of the side canals of Venice, and having no one about me but a deaf old woman who makes my bed and attends to my food. And there I eke out a poor income of about thirty pounds a year by making watercolor drawings of flowers and fruit. They are the cheapest models in Venice, and these I send to a friend in London who sells them to a dealer for small sums. But on the whole, I am happy and content. It is necessary that I should describe the position of my room rather minutely. Its only window is about five feet above the water of the canal, and above it the house projects some six feet and overhangs the water, the projecting portion being supported by stout piles driven into the bed of the canal. This arrangement has the disadvantage, among others, of so limiting my upward view that I am unable to see more than about ten feet of the height of the house immediately opposite to me, although, by reaching as far out of the window as my infirmity will permit, I can see for a considerable distance up and down the canal which does not exceed 15 feet in width. But although I can see but little of the material house opposite, I can see its reflection upside down in the canal, and I take a good deal of inverted interest in such of its inhabitants as show themselves from time to time, always upside down, on its balconies and at its windows. When I first occupied my room about six years ago, my attention was directed to the reflection of a little girl of 13 or so, as nearly as I could judge, who passed every day on a balcony just above the upward range of my limited field of view. She had a glass of flowers and a crucifix on a little table by her side, and as she sat there in fine weather, from early morning until dark, working assiduously all the time, I concluded that she earned her living by needlework. She was certainly an industrious little girl, and as far as I could judge by her upside-down reflection, neat in her dress and pretty. She had an old mother, an invalid, who on warm days would sit on the balcony with her, and it interested me to see the little maid wrap the old lady in shawls, and bring pillows for her chair, and a stool for her feet, and every now and again lay down her work and kiss and fondle the old lady for half a minute, and then take up her work again. Time went by, and as the little maid grew up, her reflection grew down, and at last she was quite a little woman of, I suppose, sixteen or seventeen. I could only work for a couple of hours or so in the brightest part of the day, so I had plenty of time on my hands in which to watch her movements, and sufficient imagination to weave a little romance about her, and to endow her with a beauty which, to a great extent, I had to take for granted. I saw, or fancied that I could see, that she began to take an interest in my reflection, which, of course, she could see as I could see hers. And one day, when it appeared to me that she was looking right at it, that is to say, when her reflection appeared to be looking right at me, I tried the desperate experiment of nodding to her, and to my intense delight, her reflection nodded in reply. And so our two reflections became known to one another. It did not take me very long to fall in love with her, but a long time passed before I could make up my mind to do more than nod to her every morning, when the old woman moved me from my bed to the sofa at the window, and again in the evening, when the little maid left the balcony for that day. One day, however, when I saw her reflection looking at mine, I nodded to her and threw a flower into the canal. She nodded several times in return, and I saw her direct her mother's attention to the incident. Then every morning I threw a flower into the water for good morning, and another in the evening for good night. And I soon discovered that I had not altogether thrown them in vain, for one day she threw a flower to join mine, and she laughed and clapped her hands when she saw the two flowers join forces and float away together. And then every morning and every evening she threw her flower when I threw mine, and when the two flowers met she clapped her hands and so did I. But when they were separated, as sometimes they were, owing to one of them having met an obstruction which did not catch the other, she threw up her hands in a pretty affectation of despair, which I tried to imitate, but in an English and unsuccessful fashion. And when they were rudely run down by a passing gondola, which happened not unfrequently, she pretended to cry, and I did the same. Then, in pretty pantomime, she would point downwards to the sky to tell me that it was destiny that had caused the shipwreck of our flowers, and I, in pantomime, not nearly so pretty, would try to convey to her that destiny would be kinder next time, and that perhaps tomorrow our flowers would be more fortunate. And so the innocent courtship went on. One day she showed me her crucifix and kissed it, and thereupon I took a little silver crucifix that always stood by me and kissed that, and so she knew that we were one in religion. 
One day, the little maid did not appear on her balcony, and for several days I saw nothing of her. And although I threw my flowers as usual, no flower came to keep it company. However, after a time she reappeared dressed in black and crying often, and then I knew that the poor child's mother was dead, and as far as I knew, she was alone in the world. The flowers came no more for many days, nor did she show any sign of recognition, but kept her eyes on her work, except when she placed her handkerchief to them. And opposite to her was the old lady's chair, and I could see that from time to time she would lay down her work and gaze at it, and then a flood of tears would come to her relief. But at last one day she roused herself to nod to me, and then her flower came, day by day, and my flower went forth to join it. And with varying fortunes the two flowers sailed away as of yore. But the darkest day of all to me was when a good-looking young gondolier, standing right and uppermost in his gondola, for I could see him in the flesh, worked his craft alongside the house and stood talking to her as she sat on the balcony. They seemed to speak as old friends. Indeed, as well as I could make out, he held her by the hand during the whole of their interview, which lasted quite half an hour. Eventually he pushed off and left my heart heavy within me. But I soon took heart of grace, for as soon as he was out of sight, the little maid threw two flowers growing on the same stem, an allegory of which I could make nothing, until it broke upon me that she meant to convey to me that he and she were brother and sister, and that I had no cause to be sad, and thereupon I nodded to her cheerily, and she nodded to me, and laughed aloud, and I laughed in return, and all went on again as before. Then came a dark and dreary time, for it became necessary that I should undergo treatment that confined me absolutely to my bed for many days, and I worried and fretted to think that the little maid and I should see each other no longer, and worse still, that she would think that I had gone away without even hinting to her that I was going. And I lay awake at night wondering how I could let her know the truth, and fifty plans flitted through my brain, all appearing to be feasible enough at night, but absolutely wild and impracticable in the morning. One day, and it was a bright day indeed for me, the old woman who tended me told me that a gondolier had inquired whether the English seigneur had gone away or had died. And so I learned that the little maid had been anxious about me and that she had sent her brother to inquire, and the brother had no doubt taken to her the reason of my protracted absence from the window. From that day and ever after during my three weeks of bedkeeping, a flower was found every morning in the ledge of my window, which was within easy reach of anyone in a boat. And when at last a day came when I could be moved, I took my accustomed place on the sofa at the window, and the little maid saw me, and stood on her head, so to speak, and clapped her hands upside down with a delight that was as eloquent as my right end up delight could be. And so the first time the gondolier passed my window, I beckoned to him, and he pushed alongside, and told me with many bright smiles that he was glad indeed to see me well again. Then I thanked him and his sister for their many kind thoughts about me during my retreat, and then I learned from him that her name was Angela and that she was the best and purest maiden in all of Venice, and that anyone might think himself happy indeed who could call her sister, but that he was happier even than her brother, for he was to be married to her. And indeed, they were to be married the next day. Thereupon my heart seemed to swell to bursting, and the blood rushed through my veins so that I could hear it and nothing else for a while. I managed at last to stammer forth some words of awkward congratulation, and he left me singing merrily, after asking permission to bring his bride to see me on the morrow as they return from church. For, said he, my Angela has known you very long, ever since she was a child, and she has often spoken to me of the poor Englishman who was a good Catholic, and who lay all day long for years and years on the sofa at a window, and she had said over and over again how dearly she wished she could speak to him and comfort him, and one day, when you threw a flower into the canal, she asked me whether she might throw another and I told her yes, for he would understand that it meant sympathy for one sorely afflicted. And so I learned that it was pity, and not love, except indeed such love as is akin to pity, that prompted her to interest herself in my welfare, and there was an end of it all. For the two flowers that I thought were on one stem were two flowers tied together, but I could not tell that, and they were meant to indicate that she and the gondolier were affianced lovers and my expressed pleasure at this symbol delighted her, for she took it to mean that I rejoiced in her happiness. And the next day, the gondolier came with a train of other gondoliers, all decked in their holiday garb, and on his gondola sat Angela, happy and blushing at her happiness. Then he and she entered the house in which I dwelt, and came into my room, and it was strange indeed, after so many years of inversion, to see her with her head above her feet, and then she wished me happiness and a speedy restoration to good health, which could never be. And I, in broken words and with tears in my eyes, 
gave her the little silver crucifix that had stood by my bed or my table for so many years. And Angela took it reverently and crossed herself and kissed it, and so departed with her delighted husband. And as I heard the song of the gondoliers as they went their way, the song dying away in the distance as the shadows of the sundown closed around me, I felt that they were singing the requiem of the only love that had ever entered my heart. End of Angela, an Inverted Love Story by William Schwenk Gilbert Recorded by Andrew Short, 